God bless you today, for today is the day the Lord has made. As God says, let today's evil be sufficient for the day. Let us deal with today. So, the end is near. How do we know the end is near? Because God said, at the end time, the world will be as the days of Noah. How were the days of Noah? When Noah was on earth, only Noah and his family prayed to God, believed in God. No other human being even gave God a thought, let alone worshipped him, served him, loved him, obeyed him. Not even a thought. All the people did of earth was give themselves pleasure with drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, perversions, satanic things, so on and so on. Not a single thought of God. And that brought about the end. When we look around the world today, do we not see a world where God is not even a single thought amongst the people. So with the end being near, we must be watchful, we must, we must be prayful, and we must pray that every soul that would say yes will say yes to the Lord so that the great harvest of souls can be collected by the Lord. But today is the day the Lord has made. So God said, let us deny ourselves, pick up the cross of Christ, and follow him. In doing so, we can have the victory. We can be of good cheer, filled with joy, because Jesus has overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. God did not give us over to a spirit of fear, but of joy. So, we need Jesus desperately every day. So, I just want to encourage you that the devil is a liar. God lives. His grace is sufficient. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. All one must do is turn around and ask for forgiveness. And Jesus is right there with his arms open. It's just that simple. Don't let the devil lie to you. Last chapter of 2 Timothy. As always, we ask in the mighty name of Jesus that the revelation of this word be given to us and that it would be hid in our hearts because we need the word of God to grow in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And one more thing I want to say before I start. You've heard me say often, sin is the problem. Jesus Christ is and him crucified is a solution. Some people think of it as a tagline, a slogan. It is not that. It is the truth of Almighty God. When I make the statement that sin is the problem, I am stating the truth. There is no other problem on planet Earth but sin. Every single problem on planet Earth is a sin. It is a result of sin. And the only solution 
is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now with the mouth, you can repeat this, but it is it in the heart? Is it believed in the heart? Is it exercised in faith in the heart? With the mouth, the confession comes that sin is the problem and Jesus Christ is the solution. But inside your heart, have you understood, have you accepted that sin is the problem? Examine yourself. When you speak of problems, do you mention that it is a result of sin? Do you call out the sin? Or do you just call out the problems? When you talk of the solutions to, to problems, what do you suggest? What do you come up with? Is it Jesus Christ and him crucified or is it a program? It is, a, is it a rehab center? Is it a psychiatrist, a counselor? What is it? When an individual has in their heart the problem is sin, and the only solution is Jesus Christ and them crucified. The individual will speak from his mouth, her mouth. When speaking of a problem, they will identify it as a result of sin and understand it as sin. And they will offer only one solution, Jesus Christ and them crucified. The turning around in coming back to Jesus. So examine yourself when speaking of things. What do you say? What what comes from your heart? So when I always say sin is the problem and Jesus Christ and him crucified is the only solution, I am speaking the truth. It is a simple truth. It is never changing. I don't care what the problem is. It is the result of sin. The only solution is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And until it is accepted in the heart, once again, you may be able to say it with your mouth, but is it in your heart? What comes from your heart? Examine yourself. First, first chapter, chapter 4, 2 Timothy. Expository study notes, King James Version. I charge you, therefore, has a weight of a legal affirmation, affirmation, sorry, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Should have been translated our God, even Christ Jesus. Who shall judge the quick, the living, and the dead, refers to the fact that all believers will stand at the judgment seat of Christ, at his appearing in his kingdom, refers here to the second advent. Preach the word, refers to the whole body of revealed truth, <clears throat> which means the entirety of the word of God. Be instant in the season, out of season. Presents the idea of a preacher holding himself in constant readiness to proclaim the word. Reprove the preacher is to deal with sin, both in the lives of his uh, his unsaved hearers and in those of the saints to whom he ministers. And he is to do so in no uncertain tones and terms. Rebuke. A suggestion in some cases impending penalty. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. This result this tells us that the reproving and the rebuking must be done with gentleness, as well as the long suffering refers to a gentleness that continues even when the message is met with rejection. 
However, the doctrine is not to change, even though it is rejected. So right here, once again, we see God, God's word to be ready to preach the gospel, to reprove to deal with unsaved and those who are saved, to deal with sin, to rebuke sin, to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine those who are being affected by sin. God always deals with sin because once again, it is sin that is the problem. Is I want you I I want you to get this in your heart. Sin is the problem. The problem is not your parents. It's not your job. It's not your school. It's not your your government. It's not your country. It's it's not the amount of money you have. The problem is sin. God always deals with sin. He always has, and he will. God hates sin. He loves us, but hates our sin. He will not accept it. We can just read. We can read all over the all over in the Bible. God is all about stopping sin in our lives. Sin is death, and God wants his people to live. So for these fake churches, these fake preachers, they never, ever, ever deal with sin, let alone reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And that's exactly why we're in the situation we're in. Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Sound doctrine pertains to overriding principles, the salvation of the sinner, and the sanctification of the saint. The cross is the answer for both, and is the only answer for both. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now tell me that this isn't going on today in a major way. Refers to people who have ears that itch for for the smooth and comfortable word, and are willing to reward handsomely the man who is sufficiently compromising to speak it. Hearers of this type have rejected the truth and prefer to hear the lie. And that's exactly why these fake churches, you go there, no, 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 no mention of sin. Don't talk about sin. You have an itching ear. You want to hear something comforting. And I want your money. So let me compromise the truth by telling you a lie. And I, may, and I may receive your money. This is the tragedy of the majority of churches in the world today. God help us. And they shall turn away from their ears from the truth. Those who false, follow false teachers not only turn away their ears from the truth, but see to it that the ears are always in the position such that they will never come in contact with the truth. And shall be turned into fables. If it's not the message of the cross, then it is fables. But watch thou in all things. Care is the idea of watching one's own life, ministry and a doctrine which are which we are proclaiming. Endure afflictions. Care is the idea of not allowing hardships, difficulties, or troubles to hinder one's carrying forth of one's ministry. It is a sharp command given with Military snap and cutness. Well, Weiss says how we in the ministry of the word need to need that injunction today. What a what a softy we sometimes are, afraid to come out clearly in our proclamation of the truth and our stand against false doctrine, fearing the ostracism of our fellows, the ecle- ec- ecclesiastical. This pleasure of religious leaders, so-called, are even the cutting edge of our immediate financial income. 
I would rather walk a lonely road with Jesus than to be in a crowd without his fellowship. That's really what it's all about. The loss of the income. These people don't want to rebuke. They don't want to exhort anyone. They don't want to reprove. They want to, don't want to examine their own life. They don't want to speak a sin because it's a proven fact. You talk about sin, people are not going to show up, and you're not going to make money. If you want to make money, you got to make people feel like champions, like winners. You have to encourage them that they're going to be rich. Then you'll get a lot of money. Now, will you be a preacher of the devil? Yes. Will you have all the pleasures of the earth? Yes. Will you die lost and go to hell and then be thrown in a lake of fire where you'll burn forever and ever? Yes. Is it worth it? No. Do the work of an evangelist. Keep trying to get people saved. Make full proof of your ministry. Does it match up with the word of God? We are reading how a ministry, a church, a preacher should be. I ask you, how many churches and preachers are like this? Only God knows, but not many. For I am now ready to be offered the word ready signifies that the Holy Spirit had already told the apostles the time had now come. The word offered speaks of the drink offering poured out upon the sacrifice about to be offered, which is in effect was the lesser part poured out upon the most important part. Only one who considered himself less than the least of all saints could write in such deep humility. And the time of my departure is at hand. This presents the fact that the servant of the Lord is immortal until his work is done. I have fought a good fight. Should have been translated, I have fought the good fight. Paul fought his fight with sin to a finish and was resting in a complete victory. I have finished my course. He had been faithful in carrying out that which he had been assigned to him. I have kept the faith. Refers here to the... Uh, deposit of truth regarding the meaning of the cross and the resurrection of Christ with which the Lord had entrusted Paul. So we see here, Paul, he's telling you that the time of his his departure is at hand. He has fought the good fight. He has finished his course. He has kept the faith. God gives people things to do. And until those things are done, you will live. God won't call you home until what he has for you, what he has asked you to do, what he wants you to do will be done. As long as you accept and obey and do what he wants you to do. And when you're done with doing what he wants you to do, what a feeling it must be. I Obviously, I never had that feeling, but what a feeling Paul must have had to be given something to obey and to complete what God had gave him and then go into a peace, into a feeling that I can't even, I can't even comprehend, like just living his life, doing what he did for God through the power of God because he obeyed God and had faith in God. And now he's coming to the end. The Lord will take him home. And he has completed what God has given him. What a feeling it must be to be given something by God and to complete it. What a feeling that must must have been for him. Henceforth, there is laid upon me for a crown of righteousness, the victor's crown, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, at the judgment seat of Christ, and not only me, but unto all them who also love his appearing. This victor's crown will go to all who consider his 
appearing precious. Do your diligence to come shortly unto me. Timothy was in Ephesus, about 1,000 miles from Rome. Consequently, it was a journey which at best would take several weeks. Whether the young apostle made it there in time or made it at all is not known. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Theolosica, presents a sad commentary regarding the one who had been blessed with such a golden opportunity. Crassus to Galatia, mentioned here only, tradition says he founded the church in France. Titus unto Dalmatia, uh, modern Yugoslavia. Only Luke is with me, presents the one who wrote the gospel that bears his name, as well as the book of Acts. Take Mark and bring him with you. John Mark, who wrote the gospel of Mark, the nephew of Barnabas. For he is profitable to me for the ministry. This presents a tremendous uh, commendation by the apostle concerning Mark. And Tychius have I sent to Ephesus. It is believed Tychius conveyed this very epistle, the last one written by Paul, to Timothy, and was perhaps instructed to replace Timothy at Ephesus while the young apostle came to Rome. The cloak that I left you at Troas with Carpus, when you came, when you come, bring with you. Quite possibly it was a summer when Paul wrote this epistle, and if he survived till winter, he would need this cloak. And the books, but especially the parchments, refers to the Old Testament books. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. It is the work of God, Paul laments, which causes him to mention this person. The Lord reward him according to his works. Ooh, man. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. I don't know what Alexander did, but he did, he, he did something to Paul that got his name in his Bible. And Paul said, let the Lord reward him according to his works. Barring repentance, judgment will ultimately come most surely, and all those who attempt to hinder the work of God, and do so by attempting to hinder the worker of God. As a human being, you trying to stop the gospel being preached and teached, um, what, what, what worse thing could you possibly do? Of whom you beware also, presents this individual as a tool of Satan, Incidentally, he lived in Ephesus where Timothy was now ministering. For he has greatly withstood our words, strongly opposed our message of the cross. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. When he, when, when one is down and anyone can do any negative thing to him or her, they so desire without any fear of reprimand or censor but will rather be applauded when quickly finds exactly how many true Christians there really are. Regrettably, there aren't, there aren't many. So basically, when someone sins or when someone finds themselves in a position, things are going bad, the devil's attacking them. Um, you know, people can turn their back on you, can go after you, attack you. Um, the self-righteousness, the unholiness in their heart will be revealed. You know, it's the old thing where, you know, kick them when they're down type thing. I pray that, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. The apostle pleads to the Lord for these weak, unnerved friends of his who solely through fear and not ill will to the cause, had deserted him, that their actions not be laid to their charge. That's mercy. That's mercy right there. He's praying that this not be laid to their charge. That's merciful. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Presents the fact that the apostle experienced an unusual degree of the presence of the Lord during this time, that by me preaching, might be fully known. 
that he might give a full proclamation of the gospel before Nero, not compromising at all. And that all the Gentiles might hear. In his defense before Nero, the trial room would have been filled with Gentiles, important dignitaries from all over the Roman Empire. From the lips of Paul, they would hear the gospel. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. This phrase has been debated almost from the time it was written by, uh, uttered by Paul. It does not refer to being delivered from Nero because he was not acquitted. As well, it had no bearing that it would be thrown, that he would be thrown to the lions, to, to the lions, as thought by some, because Roman citizens, which Paul was, did not suffer such a fate. It probably referred to the entire situation at hand, and Satan's efforts to hinder the message of Paul, which Satan was not able to do. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, which harks back to the previous verse, and will persevere me until his heavenly kingdom. Even though said in a future tense actually has to do with the entirety of his life, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This presents the apostle bursting to an inscription to, of the praise of the Lord, who he has loved so long and, and so well in all his troubles and perplexities, but never left him friendless. Salute, greet Priscilla and Aquila, two, two of Paul's earliest friends, in the household of one Sorpheus. The, the, this presents the same brother mentioned in 2 Timothy first chapter, uh, verse 16. Uh, Eratus abode at Corinth, Probably means he had now gone back to that city, which in effect was his home. But Trophius have I left at Milam uh, sick. Do your diligence to come back before winter. Hence, bring bring the cloak. Um, Ebulus greets you, and Putins and Linus with Claudia and all the brethren. This presents some of the Christians in Rome, whose names have been immortalized by their being included in Paul's letter. So definitely was. So these names, what does God think about those who who are saved or or who help who help a, a preacher get the word out? What does God think about that? For those who sincerely and truly help those who are preaching the word, God put these people's name in the Bible. What an honor. What an honor. Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, invoke the resurrection name of the Lord. Grace be with you, all men. The first epistle written by Paul was first Theologians, which was addressed to the church. This last one was addressed to a preacher. This tells us that for the church to be right, the preacher must first be right. And that is true. All right, so um, God willing, the next uh, book we'll read is Titus, Paul's letter to Titus. Um, it's not a, it's a very short book. Um, and then, um, we'll just keep going from there. So, well, God bless you and God help us.